Welcome to my channel, everybody. Hope you're okay and you've had a great weekend. Um, we're up for another video tonight, and this time round, um, the interview is with my friend, Eamon Malarkey. So welcome, Eamon. How are you going? I'm okay, Karen. I think it's evening for you in Australia. It's morning for me here in London. It's oh. good, good to meet up with you. <laughs> it's good to have you. It's good to have you here. Um, so how's your week been? Um, well, I, I work as um, a door supervisor now, so I'm, I'm going. I'm off today, but I'm going to be working tomorrow. So, um, you know, I was previously with London Underground. So, much as I'd like to retire, I can't, unfortunately. So, I've got to keep working. Oh, well, you don't look old enough to retire, anyway. What are you talking about? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be sixty in a couple of oh, months' time. Are so. kidding me? I'm, I'm going to be 60 in, in July, so the, the years are, are passing by quickly. I'm 58 on Sunday. Wow. Well, <laughs> so, you, 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 you still look like a young Kate Bush. Oh, stop that. Stop <laughs> it. I was looking at the photo and I'm thinking, wow, he needs to either go to Specsavers or he's been, <laughs> he's been, he's been really, really, really nice here because... Uh, I don't think I look like Kate Bush. Well, well I, I, I used to, I used to look like a young Tom Hanks um, forty years ago, but um, I think that's all, all in the past now. <laughs> oh, look, um, we all had, we all had youth once upon a time, and. You know, if we could go back again and, and uh, have our youth, I think we'd be doing things a lot differently. I know I certainly would. I wouldn't have been a so Jehovah's would. Witness for 35 years, that's for sure. So Yeah, I agree, I agree with you. But your, your story is interesting because um, you left it and then you came back. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I think I think that's a sign of madness, Karen. I don't I don't know what I did. Um, I was with I was with the witness organisation twelve years the first time around. Then I was away for sixteen years, and then I returned for three. You know, around the time of you know coronavirus and the lockdowns a few years ago, so I went back for three years the second time. But the organisation was very different the second time. It felt like a cult the second time I went back, whereas the first time it felt like a family of sincere people trying to help others in their neighbourhood. So it was very, very different the second time around. Oh, wow. So so <clears throat> I'm just thinking here. So when you, you came in and then you left and then you came back again, so what was what was the time period? What was it, years or...? or well, well I, was away, I, was away, I was away for 16 years. Uh, so oh, wow. I, was with, I was with the witnesses 12 years the first time, then away for 16 and then went back for three. Oh my goodness! So, uh, in these sixteen years, of course, it's going to change, isn't it? You must have thought you were in the twilight zone or something. <laughs> <laughs> Dropped out of the sky somewhere, you know. <laughs> well, it was it was it was all very bizarre when I went back because all these television screens had appeared in the Kingdom Hall, and we we never had any of that the first time. And then you've got these eight or nine men from New York giving a broadcast once a month, telling everyone how they should live their lives and behave. And uh, it was all very strange because we never had any of it the, like that the first time. And the second time, it was so highly controlled. Right. And, um, you know, I, I just got more and more troubled by it as time went on the second time around. Right. So so when you when you came back in the second time around, what year was it? What year was I it? came I went back in um 2020 and um I disassociated just last December was that about four months ago so I disassociated, disassociated in December 2023 okay and and of course um was that because of how you felt about the organization or did you have some really bad experience or, or what what was it that well, I, I just it was cults. yeah go on go on yeah it, 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 there were just there were just a whole number of things it was very very highly controlled I was ne I was never happy the second time um I suffered horrendous bouts of depression um suicidal thoughts and I felt I just felt completely trapped the second time around because the elders in the congregation were not sympathetic to my personal circumstances because I'm an older single man and it's always been my lifelong dream to to meet the right companion and it just it just has never happened and uh, you know when you explain these kind of things to the elders they're not sympathetic uh, they just want you to keep on knocking on doors you know going out the cart witnessing doing the street witnessing and uh, 
as long as you're doing the work that they want you to do, that that's all that matters. And they're, they're not concerned about my personal needs. Wow. That, that, I mean, that's terrible just listening to you there because, and I'm sure, you know, there's been many people that have been in your situation that can identify with that experience. Um, I, I think what, what does it for me is, what did it for me before I left was the fact that I couldn't equate or align the scripture where Jesus said that by this, all will know that you are my true disciples if you have love amongst yourselves. I never experienced that. All I experienced in the 35 years I was in was just psychological and emotional abuse. And, yep. and um, now I look back and I don't know why I'm saying this, but um, I felt that people were jealous, especially sisters, they were jealous of me, you know, um, I think as well, I was a bit outspoken, outspoken, you know, I didn't suffer fools gladly. And I was always sticking up for the underdog, you know. Um, yeah, I, I think that sounds a bit like me, Karen, because I've always had a bit of a maverick streak about me, which I think I've got <laughs> from my late, my, my late father. And I think I think second time around, the elders noticed that with me, that I, I tended to do things a bit differently to everyone else. So maybe maybe they kept me in my place, thought, well, we better not give this guy any more privileges in case he causes trouble. So um, I, I just found it extremely difficult second time around. And, um, you know, by the time I, I got to December last year, you know, the alarm bells had been ringing for so long. And then... Um, you know, I, I, but by the end of last year, I discovered the Australian Royal Commission, mm. the, Barbara, the Barbara Anderson story and the, the whole, you know, massive cover up of child sexual abuse. And then, okay. then, then, I, then I came across, um, you know, many other stories on YouTube about people committing suicide after being shunned by their families. And then the horrendous poverty that various witnesses suffer because they devote their whole life to the organisation. So... By the time I discovered all of that information, I thought there's um, absolutely no way I can continue with this organisation. Mm. So, oh, look, I'm, I'm, I'm just listening to you and agreeing with everything that you're saying. So were you an appointed man in the in the congregation? Or were you... Well, I was. Yeah, the, the, fir the first time around I was, um, when I did the 12-year period, I was um, a ministerial servant. I went to Pioneer School, which I loved. Right. I went. To, I went to ministerial training school, which I hated, absolutely <laughs> hated. Horrible experience. It was just, but I mean, the way of Pioneer School, I always thought was about helping people, so I enjoyed helping people. But the MTS was um, all about Watchtower procedure, and I absolutely hated it. Yeah. Um, I couldn't. Wait, couldn't wait for it to be over. So I was uh, a ministerial servant with quite a bit of responsibility the first time. And then then more than 20 years ago, I did get approached on one occasion by an elder. And he asked me what I thought about serving as an elder. And I said, no, because oh. there, there, there was a lot of turmoil going on in my life at the time because my, my brother was trying to kill me, you know, um, schizophrenic, alcoholic brother. So I had all this going on. And, I, you know, and that was one of the few wise decisions I ever made. Um, saying that I do not want to be an elder and I'm glad now in hindsight I said no oh my goodness wow oh mental health in the family um I'm hearing you because I came from that background too and then obviously having worked in it professionally uh with my own experience my own lived experience too uh, growing up so um I get what you're saying but you see these men, these elders, um, and again, if you had have accepted an appointment, perhaps you would have stuck out. You would have been the lone voice in the wilderness. You would have stuck out like a sore thumb because you get issues that people go through. These men are not equipped. They're not trained. They're not um, capable of showing empathy, compassion. And of course, you would have oozed it and you know, they would have resented that because you probably would have been showing them up for doing... Yeah, I, 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 I agree with that, Karen, because even if I had been appointed as an elder, I wouldn't have lasted very long because I would have been too, I would have been too disruptive. And, um, you know, what, I, I, I totally agree with what you just said because the, the men that are appointed as elders do not have the qualifications. They're not qualified as counsellors. They're not qualified in the law. 
Uh, they're not mental health professionals. And, you know, one of the examples that comes to my mind now is the judicial committees and um, particularly the appalling way in which they treat women. Oh. They treat women They treat women in the most awful way. And I, I've come across some YouTube interviews where, you know, I, I heard one recently where a lady appeared in front of a, a judicial committee some years ago. And, um, you, you know, you can imagine that the three oldest she appeared in front of, you know, the three of them might have been window cleaners, for all I know. You know, they've got no, no professional qualifications. They normally are, aren't they? Yeah, so so the, the ladies appeared in front of the Judicial Committee and apparently on a, you know, regarding a case of sexual immorality. And the elders were asking the most intrusive questions you can imagine. You know, the, uh, one of the things that, well, a couple of things that astonished me, they asked the lady regarding the situation, you know, what colour underwear was she wearing? You know, what 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 right what right have they what right have they got to ask such a question? And then apparently when she was appearing in front of this judicial committee, there was another elder taking very detailed notes in a notebook. And apparently once the the judicial hearing was finished, that notebook would be kept on the file of the individual in question so they'd have that notebook for years and i think not only are they not qualified to conduct these judicial committees but it's just the appalling way in which they treat people you know particularly the women they put the women through the most awful awful situation that is just so traumatic and you, you can imagine the consequences that these poor ladies suffer afterwards you know the the psychological trauma you know if 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 they're disfellowshipped, maybe they you know turn to you know drugs. Maybe they turn to alcohol. Maybe their life you know spirals into depression. Maybe even leads to suicide. So you know that alone, the judicial committees just proves in my mind how unqualified these elders are and how cruel they are as well. Mm. Oh look, um, I agree with you, and I'll add to that. Um... The judicial committees, um, by Satan's standard, the world, okay, um, is definitely illegal because in a secular court, um, a judicial hearing, the um, plaintiff would be, you know, allowed support people, they'd be allowed witnesses. Um, I know somebody, a few people actually, that have had judicials and they've asked if they could have their friends with them or somebody, the, the two witnesses that have witnessed things. They've said, can I bring my notebook in to make some... No, nothing. Absolutely nothing. And so, um, and there's a reason for that because they know, the elders know it's illegal and they know it's unscriptural because if you look at um, very quickly... Um, if you look at how things were done in Bible times, the elders would sit at the, the gates of the, you know, the, the, the groups, the, the tribes and, and everybody else. And if there was a hearing, everybody, the whole congregation heard what was going on. It wasn't clandestine, you know, a cloak and dagger, you know, make sure nobody can see the person coming in and make sure nobody can see us, you know, giving them, giving the, the person, you know, their um, uh, interrogation um that's how it happens all the time you know behind closed doors and what you just said about women i agree uh, the youngest girl that i have heard of that was brought before judicial which included facing her abuser was a five-year-old girl oh my goodness me and can you imagine a five-year-old girl sat in front of three men with her abuser there, there was nobody for her, and trying to tell these three men what that man did to her in a five-year-old girl's, you know, interpretation. Can you imagine? Disgusting. It's just, it's just, it's just absolutely unbelievable. And, um, you know, the, the elders in various congregations around the world have been given this responsibility or something that they're not in, that they should not be doing. But this is why, ultimately, I hold the governing body accountable, because the governing body are, are presiding over these congregations and they're instructing elders to do these things. And I mean, the you know, 
as time went on for me, second time around, I realised how wicked, truly wicked the governing body are. And I think you you probably share my feelings on that, Karen, that um, they have to be held to account, you know, for um, many of the wicked things that they're doing at the moment. Oh, look, I just think that the writing's on the wall, Eamon. I think, um, you know, social media <clears throat> and the advent of the internet is um, really their arch enemy. Um, and it so it should be because what has been done in darkness for decades and decades is now coming to light and all of us that have come out and in the xjw community we've all got stories or a story to tell and of course you know a thousand people two thousand people a million people can't be wrong <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And and I think I think I think the thing I find so disturbing about the governing body is that they now claim to be substituting for Jesus Christ, oh. and they've got absolutely no no right to make such a claim. Oh. And the the enormous control that they have have over people's lives that they literally control people's lives from cradle to grave. And there's there's just a number of points that I've got sort of listed here. Um, the, the baptism that they put three people through to go into the organisation is unscriptural because they're baptising in the name of Jehovah and in the name of the organisation. So you are basically dedicating your life to an organisation. And what, what, what really disturbs me about the baptism as well is how they're baptising children. Um, I, I heard of one case where a, a person, I think, was baptised at the age of 10 and was disfellowshipped a year later. So why why on earth is a child being baptised at the age of 10? You know, I mean, Jesus himself was baptised at the age of 30 mm. when he was a great, when he was a grown man and he could reason. And yet the governing body is putting um, youngsters through this terrible, terrible procedure, this terrible process. And, um, you know, and then it, it's bad enough someone being baptised and then disfellowshipped. I mean, it, it's, very traumatic for an adult but how how is it for a child oh. it must be completely overwhelming for a child yeah because uh, exactly right and you know they're brainwashed to get baptized in the first place and then of course you know um woe beside you if you're baptized when you're a teenager 16 17 years i don't know how old in england but you get a disfellowship you're kicked out of the house that's it you're on your own and that's why many people commit suicide. Many young people commit suicide because they've lost their support networks. They've lost their friends. I mean, I've just lost one friend of 15 years and I'm heartbroken. I'm devastated. But, you know, once the plaster's ripped off in terms of what you see this organisation is about, you can you can never go back. You could never go back for even the closest of closest of friends. You just couldn't, you know, because you couldn't live with yourself. If you've got any... Um, you know, scintilla of morals. <laughs> you, you just couldn't. Yeah, and I mean that, that's there's just there's a whole number of examples how the governing body are, are exercising such wicked control over people's <laughs> lives. So Baptism is one of them. Yeah. And I think just thinking of my own case, being an older single man, and just thinking of single people generally in the organisation, you know that they make they make it virtually impossible for single people to find a marriage partner you know they they, they, they focus on this um so-called scriptural principle marry only in the lord but their, their definition of that means that you've got to marry one of jehovah's witnesses and to look at it from a woman's perspective you know she might be in a congregation somewhere so she knows she can only marry a man who's a jehovah's witness but then she's also told she can only marry a man who is an appointed man, a minister or servant or an elder or in, in you know, a position of responsibility. So her choice is narrowed to almost nothing. And, you know, there are many, many people, both men and women around the world that would long to find a life companion that are being stopped from doing it by a truly wicked governing body. Mm. Oh, I mean... I don't even know what to say to that because it's, you can't, you know, you, I can't believe that you're saying it and yet everything that you're saying is true because this is exactly what's coming out now about this organisation. And, you know, I think uh, it might even take 
you know, a second video with you to get through, you know, some of the things that you need to get through, yeah. Eamon, and it takes as long as it takes because yeah. people need to hear it. And, yeah. um, you know, I for one, I mean, the more people like you speak out, the more people can be educated because you'll get, you know, you'll get Jehovah's Witnesses that are active that are looking on, you know, so so called apostate channels, and they'll see, you know, videos like this, and they'll see um, what people like you and I are speaking about, and you know, somehow they'll be able to resonate with that. You know, um, what were the what were the other subjects that you wanted to talk about? Yeah, there was, um, I mean, you know, I think a subject that we're aware of that maybe the general public are not aware of is the Pillowgate saga in the organization where which is I was just, just thinking uh, that which is absolutely unbelievable because how these um young single men maybe single women as well in uh, went into the Bethel homes around the world and I mean just to focus on the single men they were living under such mental tyranny that you know when they're alone in their room at night they're literally told not to touch their private parts you know, because they're committing some unforgivable sin that, you know, many of them are re resorting to using a pillow to, you know, relieve whatever sexual frustration they've got. And yet, yet the governing body feels it has the right to control people like this. Again, it is truly, truly wicked. And, you know, I mean, you know, us as ex-witnesses, we're aware of this, that this went on, but many members of the general public are not aware of, um, you know, the Pillowgate saga. Oh, look, when my son first showed me that, uh, Gary Bro, Gary Bro, you know, um, famously just said in a recent video that the, the kings, the governing body of the future kings, uh, I, I had to uh, laugh my head off, actually. I couldn't quite believe what he was saying. But just getting back to what you said about this pillow gate, how does Gary Bro know that people use pillows, for goodness sake? I mean, do they have cameras in the, the bedrooms at Bethel? And then, you know, like a, um, a you know, a, a, a surveillance system, you know, in another room watching, you know, all these young people. I mean, it, it beggars belief, you know, when you think about it. Yeah, and, and I, was, I was thinking as well, Karen, that the governing body have got such tremendous control over people's lives that not only do they put enormous people pressure on young, young children to get baptised, they put enormous pressure on single people to basically remain single so that they can work as slaves to the Watchtower organization. Mm. And if someone and if someone does make the mistake of getting married, if I can use that expression, make the mistake of getting married, the governing body will again try to tell that married couple not to have children because the end is so close. Mm. You know, so again, you get a married couple that would like to have children uh, are basically instructed by the organization not to have children because the end is so close. Mm. And, you know, which is, is again, truly wicked. The governing body have got nothing, no, no right to do that. And then and then you think, you know, when when that married couple go into, you know, the older years of their life, because they've devoted so much time to the Watchtower organization, they don't have any retirement savings or any money put aside because they've done menial jobs throughout their life and have devoted their life to the Watchtower organisation. And when they get to their older years, not only do they not have any children to look out for them, but they have no money put by. So again, we we see the wickedness, and I mean the wickedness of the governing body who have to be held to account for what they've done over many, many decades. Oh, look... <clears throat> Uh, yeah, I mean, I just did a video the other day on that, on the uh, hailstone message, which seems to have died a death. It seems to have, you know, the climate change seems to have melted the hailstones and, uh, the, you know, they're swimming about in a puddle of water now, not knowing quite what to say. But, yeah, these people have got no insurance policies. Um, and uh, one, one guy who's in touch with me, he was saying that he knows a friend of his in America. This is an American friend. Um, his father was um, glued to the watchtower. He gave his house to them, which at the time in the 80s was already worth um, a quarter of a million dollars. So can you imagine what the governing body got for it when they sold it on? And then this guy, yeah, this guy ended up penniless and he's homeless now as, as we speak, um, trying to claw some of his money back uh, but you know, the governing body won't be what won't be interested in uh, giving charity you know they claim that they're a charity 
you know, um, organization, but they, they wouldn't even know what the meaning was the, of the word. Yeah. They hit it if it hit them in the face, you know. So it's, 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 funny, it's funny you mention that, Karen, because I, I I went to um, a local church <laughs> earlier in the year in South London, and the um, the man that gave the um, the speech on the Sunday, he made he made a very interesting point. He was discussing the relationship between the person attending the church and then the church uh, church's relationship with that person. And he said it should be a two-way process, you know, what I as an individual can do for the church, mm. but more, import more importantly, what the church can do for me. And that made me think, having gone to that local church to hear that sermon, that when you think about the Watchtower Society, it is all one-way traffic. It's always about it's always about what we as an individual can do for the Watchtower Society. They have got absolutely no concern for us as individuals. And, you know, people devote their whole lives to the Watchtower Society. Mm. Oh, look. Um... That you've been lied to. And, you know, you know an, an, an illustration came into my mind recently, you know, that how they've, they've got millions of people around the world chasing a carrot, if I can use that expression. But it also reminded me of the world of greyhound racing, how you get the greyhounds running around a track every week chasing a fake rabbit. Mm. No matter, no matter how many times the, the, the greyhound runs around the, the track, he's still chasing a fake rabbit. And you've got the Watchtower Society, you know, they've got people out working very, very hard. You know, you can live forever in, in paradise on earth when, you know, basically the true followers of Christ have a heavenly prospect, don't they? That, you know, those that Christ deems faithful will reside with him in heaven. So the Watchtower and the governing body have been misleading people for decades and decades and it, it again it's beyond wicked it really is yeah it look it is wicked and i echo all of those things that you've said i totally agree 101 percent and you know it's the blind leading the blind and hopefully some of the most innocent people in there will wake up you know before um everything comes tumbling down but I just wanted to ask you if um, you'd be willing to come back and talk about the rest of the topics that you want to talk about. Um, yeah. uh, would that be all right, Eamon? And we can. Yeah, yeah, we, we we could we could certainly we could certainly do that another time, okay. Karen. Um, okay. I mean, m m maybe just maybe just in conclusion, I, you know, I must commend you for oh. launching launching the petition that you did recently, and um, it just occurs to me that the Watchtower society is now in a death spiral it's only a matter of time before it collapses mm -hmm. and you know i i now, I now realize it, it it's going to take the work of many thousands of xjw activists around the world to bring this wicked organization to its knees and you know whether whether people use political means legal means social media whether they speak to their family and friends their work colleagues their neighbors i think the way the way to bring the organization and the governing body to its knees is to, to attack them on many many different fronts yeah. and uh, again i must commend you for launching the petition recently which was very brave very courageous on your part and you know ju ju just just finally myself speaking personally that the, the idea that i had in mind is maybe a social media assault on the watchtower and, you know, again, I'm, I'm not particularly savvy with social media, but, you know, on various social media platforms, you can use a certain hashtag. So may, maybe we could use a hashtag, um, hashtag Just Wicked, capital J, capital W for the Watchtower Organization, Jehovah's Witnesses, hashtag Just Wicked. And then, and then highlight the many, many awful things that they've done over many decades to many people. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Eamon. We'll... We had to end the video there, unfortunately, but I just want to take uh, this opportunity to thank you, Eamon, for coming onto the channel and um, talking about your experiences and exposing the Watchtower's cruelty and abuse over the years. It's really appreciated and hopefully we can get you back on the channel again soon.